This is Rahul Reddy live from Houston, Texas. Every Tuesday from 5 p.m. Central Time to 6, we bring in immigration updates live. Uh, Emily, what, what is the topic? Do you have any interesting topic right now? Yeah, the big news of today is the Child Status Protection Act. You may have been hearing about it on social media. Um, USCIS had an update about it. They've changed the interpretation of the Child Status Protection Act, and it actually um, makes it available to help more people to stop kids from aging out. Now, does it help everybody? Does it fix everything? No, but we'll go into the details of that um, and who it helps and why it's important. Uh, we also wanted to talk about consular processing versus change of status, uh, particularly for your H-1B, which is going to be the better option if you're going through the lottery this year in the H-1B cap, um, EB-2 versus EB-3 how to figure out what your eligibility is, which one should you choose, which one is, might be better for you. And then um, same idea with H-1B versus the AOS EAD or the GC EAD, the green card, C9 EAD. Should you use that EAD or continue your H-1B or your L1 status? How do you make that uh, decision? What's the analysis look like? So to start things off, Child Status Protection Act. So. There was a big announcement today. What exactly changed in the interpretation? Emily, for a person to be eligible under Child Protect, uh, Protection Act, they must be under 21 by the time the final action date becomes current, minus the amount of time the I-140 has been pending, and their adjustment of status has been filed. So they must have four requirements, that the child should be under 21 but their age will be detected based on the I-140, uh, how much time the I-140 is spending. And uh, under and then their, uh, the, the I-140 must be approved for the parent. The 485 must have been filed. There was a fourth requirement that the final action date has to be current. So the fourth requirement, they have changed it from final action date to be current, to be the filing dates have to be Specifically for those people who filed the 485 application in October of 2020, Emily, where in EB3, the priority date was January of 2000 and January 1st of 2015. Uh, but the final action date never came anywhere closer to that period of time. So what would have happened, what did happen to some of the kids who had been there being kicked out of the application because the ch child turned 21, they kicked out of the application. And what happened, what would have happened is that if the final action date would not have become current, the children would have been kicked out of the 48 application and they have to swim on their own, which is a very nightmare for the parents and for the kids. And there are a lot of kids that were like, I used to have consultation, they used to cry. I mean, how come my sibling is getting, how come I'm not getting? Now it's a good thing for them. So what the USCIS is telling right now is that if you file a 485 application, if the I-140 has been approved and the child is under 21 under the CSPA Act. Now, CSPA Act under, under 21 means you always deduct the period of time the I-140 has been pending. And just if the filing dates are current, the child is saved. Doesn't have to be final action date. So if EB-3 somebody in December 31st of 2014, and they file a 485 application. Now they are thinking, what will happen to my kid? They are relieved right now. I mean, it's a, such a good relief. That's the reason why we keep on telling is that you need to keep on advocating these things. We're going to go into the details, but let's get to the questions. Now, what happens to the people, Emily, who, who got aged out and they were being kicked out of the application? Are their 485 has been denied because they aged out? Is there a solution for them? Yeah, so if the 485 was denied on the grounds that the Child Status Protection Act did not lock the child's age because the final action date never became current, you actually can now file a motion to reopen with USCIS. Wait, wait, Emily, 485 has been denied one year ago. I mean, how can you file a motion to reopen right now? Yeah, so there is a specific provision. Normally, you have to file a motion to reopen within 30 days of the denial but they do allow you to file late if there is a good reason for it and this would be the perfect reason it's a changed policy that was not possible to file a motion before because the decision was technically correct under the prior guidance now we have new guidance and the new guidance specifically says 
that you can file a motion to reopen if your 485 was denied on these grounds. So that's very good news. So if we have anyone who is in that situation, I've been combing through my files and found a few people that wouldn't qualify for this motion to reopen. Uh, so if you're in that situation or your child is in that situation, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help with those motions. Maybe very surprising thing is that when they normally pass anything, regulation, when they pass any statement, they give a date. It's applicable as of today. It's applicable as of one month from now. It's applicable six months before now. This one, they left it open. That means that if somebody got their 485 denied because they turned 21 30 years ago, remember this, Chinese individuals, actually Indians also moved up and back and forth. What, can they still come into this one? It's very, I mean, it's it's not there. The, 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 the website doesn't say that it's going to go only applicable the ones who filed from October of 2020. It just cited an example that if you have filed it for it fine October of 2020, they'll still be saved. But it doesn't say that's the starting point. Right. Yeah, it, it says effective immediately, but it does give the option for people who were previously denied because um, it specifically says that you can file a motion to reopen in that situation. So that is very good news, of course. It doesn't help everybody because you basically have to be in, at a point where you can file the 485 before your kid turns 21, either their actual age or their SESPA age when you subtract the amount of time the I-140 was pending. So as long as you're able to file the 485, your age is locked, you're good to go going forward. But if you age out before the parent can file the 485, there's still no help there. Now, how did they make this change? They didn't issue any regulation. Congress didn't do anything. There's no new law. With a stroke of a pen, they posted on their website. And we love them. Here's our new interpretation. Guess what else they could do that with? Not counting the family members. Yes, that's right. If they stop counting the family members, so the same benefit would happen to the kids who are under 21. That's going to be beneficial for you, though. And we have more questions on this under 21, MD. Uh, what if I have withdrawn my application because I turned 21? Ah, that's a good question. I I don't know, but I would I am file going to, a motion to reopen. I am going to, because they have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Either they have to gain. Of course, lawyers' fees will be there. We're going to charge money or any lawyers will charge money. But it's worth because if they reopen it, hey, based on your interpretation of the law, I withdrew it. Now I want to reopen myself. Mm -hmm. And when I reopen it, if they reopen it, if not, we can even take them to the court. If not, maybe they lose. But it's, it's uh, instead of them going to the entire immigration process, hey, they're an F1 most probably, they have to get an H1 after OPT and STEM extension, and then they have to file the labor certification and the priority date is backlogged in 2011. So that's going to take ever for these people. If they, under any circumstances, think so that they're qualified under this one, please contact an immigration lawyer. It is the right time for you and right time to file a motion to reopen. Even if the 485 has been withdrawn, I will take a chance. Even if the 485 has been denied two years ago, you can file a motion to reopen. There is a specific clause in the motion to reopen that if you could not file a motion to reopen because it is beyond your individual control, then you still can extend the motion to reopen time. Especially this particular law says that you can go back to, uh, to the... In, in the they in fact particularly mentioned it that if your 485 has been denied previously, you could now file a motion to reopen. I mean, they probably automatically are going to consider when we file a motion to reopen and reopen the file. Yeah, so, and this really goes back to 2015 because that's when the filing date chart came out. That's when they started this interpretation. So we've had this very narrow interpretation that we have to use the final action date in order to determine if your age is locked. That's been going on from 2015 to 2023. Think of how many people's 485s could have been denied in that time frame. Thousands, thousands of them. So now those people, even if it was in 2015, eligible still to file All the way, eight years of those people who have been picked out, who have been aged out, who have been drawn also, I would file those people. Even if they're outside the country, even if they're H1, even if they're O1, whatever visa they are, I will try to reopen these applications. Emily, the question that comes, uh, you arise is that, hey, 
They didn't went to Congress. They didn't do issue regulation. By the website, they changed and we are cheering up. When is the time that they will stop counting the family members? Could they do it? I think they can do it. And the time is when everybody who's watching this, everyone who's been watching this, everyone, it's their friends, their family, their coworkers, you've got to contact USCIS. You have to write the letters that we've been talking about for so long that we're not getting enough traction because people are not actually following through on that. And you, the, the reason that this change happened is because of advocacy efforts of different groups and individuals contacting USCIS explaining why this was bad policy. And it took eight years to get to that point. So we need to make sure we shorten that time period. It shouldn't take eight years for us to get them to agree to um, you know, not count the family members. We have an administration that clearly is willing to make these kind of changes. So you've got to act now, you've got to write those letters. So please, this administration is overall, guys. Of course, there are some minus points. Is a friendly administration to the immigrants. They don't think so that immigrants are bad. Um, we may disagree with some of their policies. We did, and we are going to continue to disagree with them. But this particular thing, we feel it's a great victory for all of you guys. Uh, those, you know, for people who have kids, that's a very sensitive issue. But now the main sensitive issue that comes up for you is, hey, what's up with you? How long will you want to wait? Are you going to do the same effort what the children have done? Because these are the letters that children have written. We always advocated that. If the child writes a letter, it's much different than when you write a letter. Have your children write a letter. They may be aging out in a different fashion because Emily has pointed out that unless you file the 485 application, it does not protect what has happened. So your kids might be aging out. So you may want to not count the family members, please not count the family members. The letter is written there, the link is provided there. So please go ahead and keep writing the letters. Things work. Last year, 200 good number of green cards were being given. Thanks for all of your letters. So please keep writing letters. And if you have anything else before I want to move to the topic of consular processing. Um, a lot of people, Emily, they want to do consular processing. I'm an H4, I'm an F1. I want to use my STEM extension because I'm going to get the tax benefits. I'm going to hedge for, I just want to be counted. Um, I don't want to file the change of status. I want to do the consular processing. I'm an L1B. I don't want to move to, uh, move to the, uh, I want to go to the consular processing. Tell me why it is disadvantaged to go to the consular processing. Are they technically counted towards the H1B number when you, Get the h one approval with the consular processing. No, and that's the biggest disadvantage because you never know what's going to happen in the future. You might today say, I've got my OPT that's valid for another two years. I want to get that tax advantage. So I'm going to ask my employer to file the H-1B for consular processing. I will activate it when I decide when I want to. I have three years to do it during the validity of that approval. And then I will go for stamping. Well, what happens if you lose that job in the next two years? That approval notice is useless to you. You can't transfer it to another employer. You're not counted in the cap because you never got the visa stamp. That goes for whether you're on H-4, whether you're on L-1, it doesn't matter. If you get a consular processing approved H-1B and you do not activate it by getting the visa stamp or getting a change of status, you're not counted in the cap and you cannot rely on that approval to be there for you for the next three years when we know what the economy is like we know how employers are they make you know layoff decisions termination decisions they don't care about immigrants and that you're tied to this particular company so you need to protect yourself by getting that change of status taking you can always with the exception of F1, you can go back to H4, you can go back to L1 by using the automatic visa revalidation, the margarita switch that we talk about so many times on here. So get the change of status, travel after it takes effect, come back in on your old status, then you get what you want. It doesn't work for F1 though, because for F1, you've got to have the valid SEVIS uh, record and that does get terminated with the H1B approval notice. So keep that in mind. 
But even for F1, even if you get those slight tax benefits, even if you have all that extra time on your STEM extension, it's you're losing out potentially. Um, and we see so many people that run into this problem after they got the consular processing approval. The only time I can see really utilizing consular processing is number one, if you're not maintaining status or you have some sort of violation where you're not eligible or your status doesn't continue through October 1st. Um, otherwise, I in the past, I have recommended it to people on L1 who were using a different employer to get the H1 because they intended to keep working for the L1 after October 1st, and you're technically not allowed to do that if you've changed status to H1 with a different employer. Um, but other than that, um, it, it doesn't make sense to consular process. 99.9% .9 of the time, though, the consular processing is the worst option when you are in the United States. Especially if your employer or anybody is suggesting you to do the consular processing, don't go for it. Because he is trying to benefit. Because Emily, some of the employers are suggesting, you know why? Because they don't have to pay the social security taxes though. So they get that benefit of extra 7% of the income. So they're suggesting, oh, you are going to save the taxes. I'm going to find in the consular processing. No, this is going to harm you. It may benefit for those bad, bad, bad employers, but it does not benefit you. It is not in your best interest to do the consular processing. As Emily pointed out, if ever you are in H4, for example, L1B, there are some times you may not want to move to the H1B. We know those circumstances. That's the reason we got this called Margarita Visa Magic. What does that mean is that you get the H1B, let's say you are on H4 EAD, and let's say in H4 EAD, you are working for three companies. And one company files a H1B, gets a H1B from October 1st onwards. How many companies you can work? Only one. Because from October 1st, you will be on H1B if you go with the change of status. But we still suggest you that. You know why? Because on, on what you will do is that on October 1st, you will not work for three companies. You will only work for one company. Then what you do is, on October 1st evening, you take a flight, you go to Cancun, you have a margarita, and October 2nd morning, you come back to USA, and you sh you tell the consular officer, look officer, I'm happily married to this gentleman or the girl, and you show them the H4 I-797, you come in, you start working on October 2nd on a H4 EAD. And the same thing could be achieved in L2, uh, sorry, L1B, L1A to switching back to. So it's called Margarita switch. There are so many times we have told you that. People may ask a question, look, I don't have the L1B, L1A or H4 stamped in the passport. How can I go to Cancun and come back? How would the U CBP or the immigration allow me to come back? Yes, that's the reason we told you to go to Margarita. That is go to Mexico. They're, they sell very nice margaritas. In some of the hotels, it's free. Okay, so you have the margarita there. You come back. You don't need a visa to come back if your I-797, I-94 I is valid. You're only going for less than 30 days. You're not applying for the visa. You're coming back. And that is clearly applicable for switching. So please do not opt for consular processing unless there are very big troubles for you on your visa status. Or, of course, you're outside the country. Now, if you're outside the country, you can't do the change of status. You don't have an option. But otherwise, please go for change of status. And right now, the H-1B quota is coming. You know that. When you go for the H-1B, when your number is getting selected, it's a big drama to get selected. You don't want to go through the lottery system. You get selected to the lottery. You spend one day on H-1B. You move back to your H-4 or L-1. You can go back to H-1B in the next 90 years without any trouble. If you have been valid in status on H-1B for one single day, you can get that H-1B for the whole six years minus one day, which you don't care, I know that. And you can get it for the next 90 years. Anything else, Emily? No, I think we can move on to the next topic. Now, I have this question for you, Emily. I filed EB-3 downgrade in October of 2020. I filed upgrading in April of 2022. 
I got my 485J filed as an upgrade. What category am I in? <laughs> Good question. And no one really knows because you they don't really um, adjudicate the 485J transfer of underlying basis when your date's not current. They're not going to look at it until they're ready to adjudicate. And there's no way to know that. That's one of the problems we've had with this whole transfer underlying basis from the beginning. What if I move to company B now? And I and when the RFE comes in or when the priority date comes in, let's say for example, EB3 moved forward, but I remember in April of 2022, I filed the 485J supplement. Now with this new company, can I use the EB3 I-140 to switch it? Because company B doesn't have the I-140 of EB3 and I switch to EB3 with company B. We have done that. Um, although the way USCIS has the guidance out there, I don't think they specifically answered that question, but the way it's written, you could kind of imply that that's what they meant. But at the same time, they were approving them when we were filing for a supplement J for a new company that did not have any I-140 approval, even though the person already switched to EB-2, we submitted the supplement J referencing the old company's EB-3 I-140 approval, and USCIS was approving those in EB-3 with the new company. So although there's no guidance saying yes or no, they were doing that. Emily, this question is, um, what, what I tell people is, look, you got to be opportunistic. First of all, company B does not have an EB3 or EB2 I-140 approval. So they have to always use company A's I-140 approval when they're filing the 485J supplement. This has been historical since the team 485J has been invented. There are two options. Is it the same job offer that has in the I-140 or is it a different company? Obviously, company B is a different company. Then it asks you which I-140 approval receipt notice. You got to be opportunities at this point of time. If the EB-3 is in advance, you, you, if the EB-3 is current, you, you use EB-3. If the EB-2 is current, you use EB-2. There is nothing like you are in EB-2 or EB-3 as Emily said. It's only when they approve the green card that you are either approved in EB-2 or EB-3. Until then, you are in limbo and I want you to use whatever is advantageous to you. And if the EB-3 moves forward, then EB-3, if it's EB-2, you can use either of those things. Now Emily, this comes the question now, million dollar question that comes in. Right now, EB-3 is an advanced. And I don't know whether the EB3 and EB2 is going to be advanced. There's a lot of multiple theories. And one guy, lawyer, says that the way that the uh, lines move, it will be very similar to that of Los Angeles highways, which, which whichever lane you are, it gets blocked out. Now, under these circumstances, should I file my palm labor in EB2 or EB3? If you have the choice and if you qualify for EB2, we would recommend always filing an what EB2. What if I'm thinking that only EB3 is going to go forward and you still say that you oh, won't file an EB2? Yes, because we can't predict these dates. You know, they do flip-flop time and time again. It happens over and over again. So even if all, you know, signals point to there's no way my date's going to be current in EB2, I'm going to stick with EB3. You've got to leave the opportunity open. If you file that perm for EB3, you completely shut the door of ever being able to get into EB2 unless you have a company that's willing to do another perm in the future, which who knows what that processing time will be. Everybody will be stuck with delayed prevailing wages and then taking forever to uh, process the perm. So when it's your time to actually file the perm, if your employer agrees, file it so that it can go in EB-2 and then you have the option for either EB-2 or EB-3 when the I-140 time is coming to file and you can even file it in both at the same time. So that gives you the best opportunity to take advantage of whichever one happens to be further ahead or behind and if after you file your 485 they switch again, you're already ready to submit the new one and transfer underlying basis to the other one. Um, Emily, let's go to the choice of H-1B or AOSCAD. We have already debated a lot of times and a lot of the lawyers are telling it's only H-1B option, never go to EAD. Yeah, but I think 
you know, right now it's looking like people are going to have to stick with that for five, ten years after they've already been renewing. But if they keep on renewing, H one Bs will will make a lot of money at their expenditure. Yeah, who makes the money? The lawyers who are suggesting. Do we have to tell them? (laughs) I guess not. Yeah, I mean, you have to tell them we make money on H one Bs, we make money on the H one H uh, one B extensions, we make money on H four extensions, and then they still have to extend the AOS EADs and and uh, advance parole. Do we need to tell them or just keep making money on them? Well, well, you know, we're not supposed to have conversation, but we are having the conversation. And when I was on four eight five EAD. I let my H4 go and I used the EAD and I let my wife let her H1B go use the EAD. That's what I did. It was a long time ago. You don't now I don't want to tell my age to you guys, okay? That's too much secret, okay? But I on the 485 EAD did attend the 485 interviews, not mine. But somebody else interviews as a lawyer, and the client asks me, Rahul, when did you get the green card? I didn't say anything because if I tell him I just have an EAD, he's going to run away. <laughs> anyway, I was working with a good law firm, very nice law firm. So after the interview, I told him, oh, I did not yet get it. I'm just attend. I'm, I'm just getting an EAD. I did let my non-immigrant status go. And so please make your choice. There are some slight disadvantages, and for us, there are more advantages to just go on EAD, uh, that's what our suggestion would be. Then. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to be aware of if you use the EAD is the processing times both for the EAD renewal and the AP. Um, so that's one benefit of having the H-1B and having that visa stamp is you don't have to worry about how it's taking 11, 12 months to get the AP renewed. Uh, but those processing times will hopefully improve, so that's not going to be a continued problem, or hopefully they'll issue the EAD and AP together going forward. I don't know why they separated those and started issuing one for two years and the other for only one year. Um, but as things improve, you can continue to monitor that, and if APs are being more easily obtained, more quickly renewed, then you can consider that maybe it's safe to forego the H-1B. There are certain circumstances where we tell people, no, keep your non-immigrant status if there's any kind of risk in the 485 application. But for the most run-of-the-mill where your I-140 is approved, there's not a lot that goes wrong with the 485, and it is relatively safe to utilize the EAD and the AP. That's why they give it to you. Anything else? Maybe for good questions. I think we can go into the questions. Uh, Sundam has this question. I've applied for POM in October of 2022. How long it's going to take to get the POM approval? It's taking about seven to eight months to get the I-140 approval. Question that comes from Sudha. Uh, my kid will be 18 this August and the priority date is February 2018. Is he eligible? We don't know yet, Sudha. But one thing is that if the filing dates become current, mostly you will meet the all of the requirements before the child turned 21, uh, he will be eligible for the SESPAC. There are certain other conditions, slight small conditions, clerical conditions to be met. But if the fi- filing dates become current and you're going to file the 485, it will become current. Now, whether or not the dates are going to move will depend entirely on you guys if you keep writing the letters because we don't think so that the priority date is going to move pretty soon to February of 2018 unless you do the efforts of writing to the congressman administration to have them not count the family members. The letter is given to you there. Please write it. These are these sometimes will be successful. Keep writing them. If that becomes successful, most probably it will be current for you, and then you don't have to worry about the date. Uh, VJ says priority priority dates just seem stuck for the last couple of months in the visa bulletin. When can we expect movement? Well, you have to look back to what things looked like before October 2020. Um, really from 2015 to October, September 2020, there was very little movement. And that's exactly the same situation we're in right now because we only have the base number of um, green cards available in the categories. EB1 is being used up, EB2 rest of the world is being used up. We're not getting any extra spillover into EB2 India. 
that's going to continue. So look at how the dates moved from October 2015 to September 2020. That's what's happening again. And on top of that, we have 40,000 people that filed the 485 that are in line ahead of you. And there are not green cards available just for them. How long is it going to take us just to get through that 40,000? That may be five to 10 years before the dates move beyond what they were in October of 2020. So it is going to be very slow movement. Don't expect any big jumps anytime in the near future, unless you guys write the letters and we get them to stop counting dependents or we get them to recapture unused green cards. So that card is asking this question, I'm the same question what you addressed is, is there a chance for a visa recapture through policy change? Absolutely. Look at the policy change today. I mean, these policy changes don't hit the headlines in the Fox News, guys. If they change the policy and recapture that, it does not hit the Fox News or CNN. It just changed policy. They won't even know. We are in. We are negligible there. Okay. So it can. It can happen. Um, it's. It's up to you to write the letters. We have drafted it. I want you to write it. And recapturing is one thing. I also want you not counting the family members. Look how they did with the children. They could do with you guys. That would be so good if you keep on your efforts though. Um, Momo says, can I sue after one year of the I-485 filing at the Texas Service Center and does not having the EAD for a healthcare worker strengthen Ooh. the case? Um, yeah, I do not see any problem with suing after one year. So when the 485 has been pending for one year, USCIS, of course, tells you that's totally reasonable. That's our normal processing time. Oh, wait, our normal processing is really 22 months. So there's no reason for you to uh, contact us or contact your senator or contact your congressman. We can't do anything anyways. Well, once you file a, a federal lawsuit, their story changes and they're approving those cases because a judge is not going to agree that that is reasonable. You may not want to contact Stephen Brown in our, in our office. That would be the right person for you in our office to take up your case if there is any delay. Uh, one thing is that if you want your 485 to be approved though, uh, one issue is that your final action date has to be current. I mean, if your final action date is not current though, they will not, I mean, we are not going to file the court case for you. Though. Of course, we can file if there is a delay in the EAD or advanced parole, we can. Uh, that is something only to file for EAD and advanced parole, but we will not request the court to give you the green card because the final action date is not correct. Uh, v Log has this question. Uh, can I enroll for the PhD program when I'm on the H1B? Absolutely you can. No problem. People can study while they are on H1B. Do, I, do you need to get any permission from anybody? No, you do not need to get any permission. One thing is that if the PhD requires that you need to work, some of the PhDs require, uh, not, I mean, work to get paid, I mean, when you're getting paid in, the, in there, then definitely you would require an H1B from them uh, or some other requirement is there. But as of now, just to join the PhD without working, without getting paid there, you're good. You can get the uh, tuition waiver. Those are perfectly legal. You don't need to do anything for it. Praveen wants to know if my H1B renewal will be affected if the perm is denied. Um, due to some of the recent job cuts. He has an I-140 that's valid from his old job. Um, so you can continue to use the old employer's approved I-140 um, to keep getting H-1B extensions regardless of what's going on with the current employer as long as the priority date on that old I-140 is not current and your employer did not withdraw that I-140 within 180 days of the approval. Um, so you should be able to keep using that approved I-140, keep getting those three-year extensions while you work out whatever happens with the perm with the next company. Uh, Naveen Chopra, uh, how long does the US UAE uh, country of birth cross-chargeable will take? Once the 485 has been applied, how long will it take? And they are processing the I-140 train processing. Anywhere between four months to even two and a half to three years. Um, but once it crosses one year, then that's the right time. If you want to, you can go sue the USCIS in the court. Uh, question that, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Sudeep says, I applied for my perm in October 2022. How long is it taking for perm approvals right now? Anywhere seven, eight, nine months. Um, we're seeing that 
um, it, it is continuing to get longer and longer, um, so you've got some time to wait still. Pranav has this interesting question that this is the most common question we get right now. His priority date is 2013. He filed a 485 application. The online status says case remain pending. Is this normal? This is perfectly, 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 perfectly normal. There is other people who says that fingerprint taken. That is also normal. Don't get panic. Either of those messages are not a cause of problem for you. That means that the case is pending. Fingerprints taken or the case remains pending. Both of them means the case is pending. You don't have to worry about it right now. Of course, when the final action date becomes current though, then, a, then that is the right time for you to follow up or take it to the court though. Uh, Sandeep says, if a child is on F1 instead of H4, are they also protected under the Child Status Protection Act in this new interpretation? Yes, so just like your spouse does not have to be in H4 to apply for the 485 with you, your child does not have to be in H4 to apply for the 485 with you. As long as they're your child and they're under 21 at the time you're able to file the 485, and they're maintaining some non-immigrant status, it doesn't have to be H4, then they can file the 485 along with you and they will be protected by the Child Status Protection Act. So that SESPA does not depend on what your child's immigration status is. All it is looking at is, is this person eligible to receive the green card with the parents because their age was locked under 21 at the time the 485 was filed? Melina has this a little bit tricky question. Uh, first question was that, uh, can her husband travel to USA on H4 and leave USA within one week? Absolutely not a problem. He can come and go back on H4, no problem. Um, if the H1B extension has been filed, can I file the H1 and H4 EAD in premium processing while he's in India? No, you cannot file the H4 extension while he's in India. It is, he can file only when he is in the United States. Now, if he leaves the country when the extension is pending though, there are some implications I would, because if they, if they adjudicate the H4 when he's outside the country, there are some negative implications I would definitely want you to consider the uh, Prem is on H1B, has an I-140 approved from an old employer and is undergoing an internal transfer to Canada. And his employer is saying his H-1B will be canceled due to the move. And he wants to know what are the future prospects to come back to the United States. Um, so assuming that you've not used up six years of your H-1B time, and even if you have, actually in your case, because you have the I-140 approved from a prior employer, um, you can go to Canada. Your employer can withdraw that approved I-140. And any time in the future, you can have a new employer or the same employer file an H-1B petition in consular processing because you're outside the U.S. without going through the lottery to recapture whatever time was left of your six-year limit plus add three years based on your approved I-140 if your final action date is not current at that time and you can come back to the U.S. anytime in the future. There's no deadline for that. It doesn't have to be within six years of when you were counted in the cap. Uh, none of that matters. So Shar Dati Mukherjee, uh, prior to date is 2013, primary got the green card, dependent remains on EAD and AP. Um, is it good to wait or apply F2A? Hands down, F2A, F2A. Here is a reason though. How do we know December 2013 is going to be current in the next one month? Or is it going to take next 20 years? There are time periods where the priority date does not move for a decade. So you want to take the chance? I would not like to. File a F2A, you're not going to lose anything. You may gain, you may lose little money, but you're not going to, because F2A takes only two years to get the green card. Now you want to wait for, you want to take the gamble? I would not like to. The gamble here is only a little bit money that you're going to spend, but not on the existing 4H application. It's not either or, it's both. So, I, I, if I were you, I would file F2 application. 
Uh, Suha says, my kid will be 18 this August, and my priority date is February 2018. I, I so you got that yeah. one already? Um, we can't, we can't. EB2 priority date is now, but then my biometrics is done last week. How long does it take to get the GC? Um, it, it may take anywhere between four months to two and a half years. Um, since your priority date is current, uh, it's going to take anywhere between four months to two and a half years. SK says, can, how do you compare the H4 EAD with the H1B? Uh, good question. So some of the benefits of the H4 EAD, you can work for any employer, you can work for no employer, you can work for yourself, you can start a business, you can work for 10 employers. You can do anything you want with an H4 EAD. Some of the downsides of that are you're reliant on your spouse's continued H1B status. So if your spouse goes out of status, you go out of status. And what a lot of people were having trouble with and were choosing the H1B for some time was the processing time of the renewals of the H4 EAD. People were losing their ability to work because of the gaps in employment authorization for H4 EAD and choosing the H1B instead. Um, otherwise, the H1B, you can only work for the employer that has the approved H1B. Your employer has to comply with the LCA requirements, the prevailing wage. You can only work in the work location that you've been authorized for. If you want to work for a second company, that other company has to file a concurrent H-1B. Um, those are some of the, the, the downsides of the H-1B. So each of them have their advantages, um, but you can choose back, especially if you get the, are on H-4 and EAD, and as we talked about earlier, you get the H-1B in the lottery, get that change of status, you can go back and forth as much as you want. Vijay Raghavan has already sent an email to Congressman and they got a standard response. Can we keep emailing them again and to realize the importance? Thank you for sending the email to Congressman. I would, Vijay, want you to send it to the USCIS director and USCIS ombudsman though. I definitely refrain sending to the same Congressman again. That is not respectable, it's not nice. Uh, you send it, but what I would do, Vijay, is that every family gathering that I go, I will take my laptop, I will have them email it, sit it down next to them, have them do it. That is the best way of getting these things done properly. Because it's going to be the numbers of people who are contacting. And especially if there are young kids between 16 and 20, if they write those emails, things move much faster than you and me, uh, me as a lawyer and you. So, so definitely, the more the people, but not the same email sending to the same congressman again, that is not fruitful. I would use the energy somewhere else. Sometimes it may take off the congressman when we keep writing the same thing, saying that this guy is wrong. I already told him, it may work against you rather than favor. Uh, Freak says, my H-1B was approved January 31st, and I'm going for stamping on February 21st, but I didn't get the I-797 from USCIS yet. Can I go for stamping without it? Yes, you can. Uh, because of the PIM system that the consulates use, USCIS will scan and upload a copy of your petition and all the approval details into this PIM system. Consular officers have access to that. So to schedule the visa interview appointment, all you needed was the I-797 receipt number, which you already have, and they can look up the approval details when you go for stamping. It's not required to carry that I-797 approval notice anymore. I believe you forgot the main topic, actually. Um, that's Anna Stevens is asking this question. Can you throw some light on having H-1B stamping within USA? Yeah, today's news totally. We're like back to the Trump years where we had yeah. multiple updates. Uh, in yeah, a day in Trump year it was all track. bad news and now we got like so many good. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good news, guys. Let's let's uh, touch the topic. Emily. What is this H-1B stamping within, within the United States? Now they have issued a notification saying at the end of this year, they will start stamping H-1B in the United States. Though. Now, the one thing that was there in the stamping previously when they closed somewhere in 2004 was that when you are on H-1B, when you move extension of the H-1Bs with the same company or a different company, we could send the H-1B stamping to the, uh, to the Washington DC's Department of State. They used to stamp the passport and give it back. Same thing with H-4 though. But what about moving from F1 to H1? Can we get the stamping within the United States or do we still have to go? 
What about H4 to H1? What about L1 to H1? Yeah, we don't have all of the specifics, but we do know from the Bloomberg report, they did use the words renewal and initial. So when we say initial, we don't mean your first stamping ever and you're outside the U.S., but we mean if you're in the U.S. already, you've already gotten a stamp for your current status or your prior status, came to the U.S., and now you've changed status from F1 to H1, you may be eligible to send in your passport for visa stamping while you stay in the U.S. You mail it in, get the stamp on it, it gets sent back to you. Um, now you don't have to worry about visiting the consulate when you travel next time, you've already got it done. So that's a huge benefit. It's going to free up appointments for people who don't have that option, for all the people who are outside the U.S. and have been waiting, free up appointments for B-1 visas, which are taking 444 days to get the simple appointment for, uh, because it's going to cut down the number of people that have to visit the consulate to get their stamp. They can do it while they're here, in the comfort of their own homes. You don't have to go anywhere. I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of biometrics or fingerprinting appointment, so you might have to go um, to a local office for that, which that was not there before. Um, but it's going to be a huge benefit. You can basically always have a valid visa stamp once you're in the U.S. Yeah. so that you always travel. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Can I get an appointment? What if I get a 221G? You know, and people getting stuck outside the U.S. and not able to come back, missing marriages, missing kids' births, missing funerals, all those sorts of things, business meetings. Um, so it's going to be a huge benefit. When will it take effect? We don't know. They say later this year. Sometimes these but, things get delayed. Yeah, but, but in general, though, the administration is making it more softer and better for the immigrants, especially when the Trump era was a really bad era for us mm -hmm. at that point of time. But right now it looks... Um, now, some technical details with regards to how this stamping is going to work. Um, we, I have to go back to 2004. Emily was not a lawyer at that time. Uh, she was working with us, but she was not a lawyer. Um, so I take the credit that I have experience in those things. It's been now 20 years they removed that system. Um, the way it works is that we get the DS-160 filled out, give them by the passport pictures, um, we give the original passports, we send it in FedEx, and we prepare a FedEx coming back from there to us too. Because we don't, otherwise they'll send in the USPS mail. <laughs> you know how that comes in? No, we used to keep the FedEx going from our office to the Washington DC office and from there back so that passports will always come back. We never had any issue with regards to passports missing or anything like that. Uh, but it was only allowed for the extensions of the H-1B, as Emily was pointing out, in the Bloomberg News, they said it's it will be applicable to the initial applications. But is that statement coming from Bloomberg? Coming Because uh, the Department of State leaks the information to Bloomberg. Uh, but is it information that is given by a third party, neither Department of State nor Bloomberg? When I looked into that, it is leading to a conclusion that that is a third party information that it's initial application I hope so the third party also has some uh, uh, has some inside information but yes things are going to be getting stamped in the united states um i'm pre pretty sure by 2024 the stampings for the extensions will be in usa instead of going outside the country which is going to free up the counts rate like anything, anything. And it's going to be very great news as in this set of word. And this should be for H1, H4, L1, and L2. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be a huge benefit. Um, question from YouTube. This one doesn't have a name on it. My daughter aged out in December 2022, but we had filed her 485 in October in 2020 and received the EAD and AP that's valid until 2024. Now she's on F1 with the recent CESPA rule. What is her current status? Yes. Yeah, she can qualify. So I'm she's assuming when you say my daughter aged out, nothing happened to the 485 because USCIS hasn't figured it out yet. So if she has an EAD and AP that's valid till June 2024, she still has a pending 485. She also happens to be in F1 status, but both of those are happening at the same time. And with this new rule, she can qualify because I'm assuming she was under 21 when the 485 was filed in October 2020 and it was filed based on the filing date 
now the age is based I on mean, the filing date. I want to retreat the question the person asked. Okay, I know that you told the answer, but I want to make sure. The child right now is above 21 as of today. The child right now is on F1 visa, no longer on H4 visa. Is that all your statements are current or not? Yes, still correct. And even if the 485 did get denied, this is a case where a motion to reopen can be filed. Yeah, that's a good point about it. <laughs> Praveen has this question. <laughs> if Trump becomes the next president, how difficult it is for him to remove these stampings from the USA? How difficult is it to reverse the Child Protection Service Act thing? Um, for sure, with regards to the stamping, though, uh, he can do it very easily. But when it comes to the Child Service Protection Act that was being allowed right now, that's going to go to the court litigation. We're going to fight to the nail for it. But for the stamping, most probably nothing can be done. Yeah, I hope we don't go there, buddy. Okay, let's pick something. We have good news right now. Let's mm -hmm. enjoy it right now. We'll discuss about the bad news, the projection later on. Um, Sen has the primary got the green card, but the dependent in 485 is still pending based on the employment based. And he heard that dependents are not eligible to file the 485 under F2A. He wants to know if she's eligible to do a transfer of underlying basis from the employment-based to family-based. Um, so yeah, assuming that she was on a derivative dependent visa for the non-immigrant status, like you were on H1B, she was on H4, you got your green card, now she's no longer on H4, you're right, she's not eligible to file a second 485. But there are ways around it. Yeah, that's true. You that's can true. have them travel in advance parole and come back in advance parole mm -hmm. and they will be eligible for the 485, right, Emily? Yeah, because family-based is a different um, rules apply. You don't have to be in a non-immigrant status to file for the family-based 485. You either have to be in a non-immigrant status or paroled in. So you could potentially use the advanced parole um, and then file that second 485. You also do have the option of doing the transfer of underlying basis from the I-140 to the I-130. Problem is there's no filing mechanism for it. Like an employment base, we have that supplement J to do that and we do get some kind of receipt and confirmation. For a family base, there's no, um, there's no way to do that. It's just a matter of sending letters that a lot of times go unread and sending it multiple times. You eventually have to get a congressman involved usually um, so it may be beneficial to look into other options or even consider consular processing the family-based. Question from uh, Subbu Palimini Sami. Uh, we both are on 485 EAD. I'm the primary applicant. My, can my wife buy, buy any business? Um, and if she conducts a business, will it cause any problem in the 485 interview? No problem. None whatsoever at all as long as the business is legal. What does a legal business mean? A restaurant is a legal business, a bar is a legal business. Now, the only thing that we come across sometimes is, can she own a marijuana dispensary? Marijuana, the ganjai we call in our language. No, that's not allowed. Well, it's a very long, complicated story. But any other things, mostly what I can think about, okay, uh, is owning a restaurant, owning a business, uh, Kumon, some math teaching facilities. And can she work there? Absolutely she can. Will it cause any problem in her getting the green card? No. In fact, it's a very good thing though. Did you go for the interview? Oh, your wife is doing your business. I mean, she's entitled. She's a self-employed self person. She's going to pay taxes for the United States. Absolutely a good thing, not a bad thing at all. Uh, question from Amit. Uh, can I port the date from EB3 to EB1A? Absolutely, you can. Uh, Varun, my priority date is 2014, but I received a medical RFE from the San Antonio field office. Are they going to sit on it and ask me to resubmit it again when the date is current? Yes, they are. So they're, they're, they might open it. They might add it to the file, review it. Um, but it's going to expire in two years, and so if the date doesn't become current by then, you're going to get an RFE asking for another medical. We don't know why they're doing this. They had figured it out and stopped sending those RFEs for a while, um, but 
now we're back to, they have to, I guess, reinvent the wheel and figure out that they're wasting government resources by issuing these RFEs. I guess they have nothing else to do because there's no green cards available for them to approve. Emily, here comes a curveball from Subhu Palnisami. The wife wants to buy the same company which sponsored the green card. This is EB1A green card application. The, well, it wasn't a self-petition? Sorry, EB1C. Oh, okay. Uh, let, let me see what he got before. I, ah, so then the qualifying relationship won't be there anymore. Uh, yeah, I don't even know whether it's a EB1C or EB2 or EB1. Uh, can she buy the company if it's EB2 or EB3, though? Uh, I don't see any problem with that as long as the 485 has been pending for 180 days. 180 days. So 485 has to be pending for 180 days. So, uh, yeah, we don't see if it's an EB1C, EB2, or EB3. She buying the company. We don't see any problem. As Emily pointed out, 180 days is a crucial thing to look forward for. Um, Shahul says, can we invest or own a portion of a business on H1B status? Uh, potentially, you have to be really careful here because you there is a fine line between owning a business and running a business or operating a business or working in the business. Um, so you can be a passive investor, meaning that you invest money, someone else is running the business and you earn profit when the business is profitable. That's totally fine. But if you're signing paperwork on behalf of the company, if you're the authorized signatory at the bank and you're going to the bank and depositing checks or it's a restaurant and you're you know, gonna be the host or the hostess for that day at the restaurant because somebody called in sick, those things are work and it is not authorized if you don't have an H-1B with that employer. So you have to be very careful with that. We generally recommend waiting until you have an EAD to do that unless you're literally planning on just investing money and doing nothing else. Whenever you are in the borderline, as Emily is pointing out, like a restaurant or a real estate company where you're involved in some way, I would definitely check with a lawyer before you do any activity as such. But we have a question which actually on the same lines here. Uh, this is coming from uh, Chintan. Can my wife continue to invest in stocks and even every month even if she's an h4 EAD is expired and now h4 and h4 EAD is still pending absolutely she can now investing in stocks is not considered to be working so if she's investing every day five transactions buying and selling still not a problem because it's still not considered to be that you're working now when it comes to the restaurant or some other thing it's completely different because there may be some involvement of you going there. In the stock, let's say for example, you're buying a stock of Microsoft and, and Google, you're playing with them, depending on which one is better, and you're buying and selling it, which one is better. You're not working for Microsoft, you're not working for Google. So you can, even if you don't have an EAD, even if you're an H1B, even if you're L1, you can do that. Uh, Santosh is currently working for company B, but he filed the green card with company A, his previous employer. Now he got the EAD and AP. He wants to know, do I have to join my previous employer now? Can I travel out of the country without joining the previous employer? Do I need to file a supplement J before I travel? Uh, so remember, the 485 is based on an offer of future employment. It's the it may be the job you're in now, but for a lot of people, it's the job you're gonna move into when you get your green card. It does not have to be the job you move into when you get your EAD. It's when you get your green card, that company is going to offer you the job and you're gonna take the job at that time. Um, so there's no requirement that you submit a supplement J. You can submit a supplement J if you no longer intend to go to work for that company and want to stay with the current company and wanna move the process to the current company, um, but you don't need to do that in order to travel. Well, I think we're out of time for today. Thanks so much for joining us. And just a reminder that we are on Instagram and Facebook. So follow us there, Instagram at RN Law Group and on Facebook, Ready and Newman PC. We're posting content daily. We gave lots of updates today about the stateside visa renewals, about the um, guidance on Child Status Protection Act. We're doing live news giveaways and updates. So follow us there so that you can get all the latest in between our Tuesday uh, lives. Don't forget that we do have a daily Zoom conference. It's free call for half an hour. You can come there. You can ask any question. I or Emily or 
Rebecca Chen from our office will be there. It's a daily free conference call, a uh, Zoom call. You can ask the question. It's, the link is provided at the bottom. Thank you very much for tuning in.